before we move towards tonight's speaker, I want to mention that next Tuesday we also have a special opportunity. Laurel Neem, who's the author of Animal Investigations, is coming into town. She just recently published a book that looks at the U.S.'s only, uh, if you will, forensic lab for illegal wildlife trafficking and trade. It's pretty amazing that the amount of money that's brought in to the U.S. through this illegal activity is second only to the drug uh, black market. So there's millions and millions of dollars that are being spent for animal parts and uh, endangered species. And Laurel's going to talk how the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is involved in cracking some of these cases. So come out for Wildlife CSI or at the zoo, we like to refer to it as ASI, Animal Scene Investigation. Uh, that'll take place here, 7.30. I will say that I think we're going to fill up this auditorium and have to have an overflow. So if you want to see it, definitely get here early. So I'd like to introduce Richard Spiner with the Alaska Wilderness League who will tell us a little bit about their organization and tonight's speaker. Richard? Thank you, Jim. Uh, it's really great that uh, this is the second time we've done this with the zoo and the Academy of Science. And uh, what we've done is we're trying to get more people acquainted with what the Alaska Wilderness League does. We're the only organization in Washington, D.C. strictly devoted to Alaska issues. And uh, the nice thing about it is we're trying to preserve those special places in Alaska. We're the lead organization, so people like Audubon and Sierra Club and those kind of folks come to us because we're the experts on the Alaska issues. And we're there and we're your voice on Alaska issues in Washington, D.C. One of the things I like about it is that we're trying to preserve special places. I always like to use the example that Squaw, Key, Squaw Creek here in Missouri and Swan Lake are special flyways most of you are familiar with. And those are the kind of places we're trying to preserve in Alaska. We're not trying to stop development everywhere. But there are those unique areas. And it may be an old growth forest in the Tongass, which you'll hear a lot about tonight. It might be the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, or Teshpak Lake, and the National Petroleum Preserve. So that's what we're all about. Uh, after the program tonight, uh, Amy will be signing books out back here. And for $40, you can get a membership to the Alaska Wilderness League and also get one of her fine books and a DVD on the Tongass. So I hope some of you, after you've heard a program tonight, will like to uh, join the league and uh, have a wonderful book and a DVD. We're really quite lucky tonight to have Amy Gulick in to make a presentation to you. Amy is an award-winning nature photographer. She's a writer. She's a fellow with the International League of Conservation Photographers. Her images and stories have been featured in Audubon, National Wildlife, Outdoor Photography, and other publications. Her work in Alaska has received numerous honors, including the prestigious Daniel Hausberg Wilderness Image Award and the Alaska Conservation Foundation, from the Alaska Conservation Foundation. Her new book, Salmon in the Trees, is what she's going to talk about tonight. And it's a great concept, and I know you're going to love it. And we've uh, enjoyed having Amy in. And uh, well, further ado, Amy Gillick. Thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, I'd like to thank Richard uh, and his wife, Tony Armstrong, uh, the Academy of Science, uh, Jim Jordan, the St. Louis Zoo, and the Alaska Wilderness League uh, for having me here. Um, as Jim uh, mentioned to you, I am from Seattle, and we don't know what that bright orb in the sky is that I've been seeing the last couple days, so um, very vitamin D deprived. So I think I've just gotten my uh, annual quota of vitamin D um, in the last year. It's been, in the last two days, it's been absolutely beautiful and you have an absolutely beautiful city. Um, this is just stunning. I, I don't want to leave uh, tomorrow. <laughs> um, and a big thank you to all of you for being here, for taking the time out of your busy lives and fighting traffic and uh, you know, maybe missing dinner. Uh, again, it's much appreciated and I'm, I'm very honored uh, that you're my audience tonight. 
So I'm often asked, um, what are the hazards of uh, being a nature photographer, um, particularly one who spends a lot of time in wilderness areas? Uh, is it traveling in bear country, uh, negotiating a class four river, uh, flying in a bush plane with the door off? Um, while all of these things are potentially hazardous, I would have to say that they somewhat pale in comparison to something else. And that is curiosity. To do what I do, make pictures that tell stories, you have to have a healthy amount of curiosity to sustain your interest for the often uh, very long time it can take to pursue these stories. So why would this be hazardous? Well, you've probably all heard the phrase, curiosity killed the cat. And while my curiosity, as far as I know, hasn't actually killed anyone, those who know me well will attest that I often drive people mad with my endless questions of why things are the way they are. Uh, those of you with small children um, know exactly what I'm talking about. So questions like, why is the sky blue? Why are no two snowflakes ever the same? And why are there salmon in the trees? It is this last question that I've spent the last three years of my life pursuing. And while no one was killed or injured in the making of the story, the journey became somewhat of an obsession for me, fueled by curiosity. But if curiosity killed the cat, then satisfaction brought it back. And I'm honored to be here to tell you the story that I brought back uh, from my adventures pursuing salmon in the trees. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions, and if you could hang on to them until the end, uh, that would be terrific. So where to begin this crazy quest for salmon in the trees? Well, before leaving home, a friend gave me some sound advice. He said, remember, Amy, a journey of a 1,000 miles can end in failure. Good confidence builder there. <laughs> so at the start, all I knew was that I needed to go to Alaska. But Alaska is so mind-boggling in its size, it would be like saying I needed to go to Africa. Alaska is by far our largest state, more than twice the size of Texas, our second largest state. And most of us tend to think that all of Alaska is a vast frozen expanse with roaming polar bears, and well, if there are any people there, then they must all live in igloos and travel by dog sled. And while that's a somewhat accurate description of some parts of Alaska, where I needed to go is not what comes to mind when we think of our 49th state. I was going to the rainforest of Alaska. Now, I don't know about you, but I always thought that rainforests were in Brazil and Indonesia, uh, warm places near the equator with parrots, primates, and pythons. Well, those are tropical rainforests, also called jungles. The rainforest of Alaska is what's called a coastal temperate rainforest. This is one of the rarest ecosystems on the planet. Uh, so most of Alaska's rainforest uh, is in what's called southeast Alaska. This is also known as the panhandle of the state. Uh, you can see right down here. Um, and it's also known um, as uh, the inside passage uh, for anyone cruising all of those sheltered uh, waterways that weave among thousands of islands. Um, almost 80% of southeast Alaska is the Tongass National Forest. The Tongass is a place where the forest meets the sea. Clouds slam up against the jagged coast range, uh, separating Alaska and British Columbia on the mainland, and this creates rain. This creates lots of rain. More than 200 inches a year in some places nourish this coastal forest. This is why rubber boots are an essential part of every Southeast Alaskan's wardrobe. Much of the Tongass is spread out over 5,000 islands in what's called the Alexander Archipelago. So no point on land is far from the sea, and at times this line is blurred uh, between where the forest ends and the sea begins. The, sea, the two are just so interconnected. So you'll see things here like bears digging for clams uh, on the beaches, Marbled murelets, this is a seabird that nests high in the trees and feeds in the ocean. Humpback whales cruise the forested shorelines. And animals like ravens and otters carry mussels and clams from the beaches into the woods. You can be miles inland and all of a sudden you'll just stumble across uh, these, these uh, mussel shells in the middle of the forest. 
At 17 million acres, it's about the size of the state of West Virginia, the Tongass is by far our country's largest national forest. About 70,000 people live in this part of Alaska, but because of all the islands and the rugged mountains on the mainland, uh, the most reliable modes of transportation here uh, are not automobiles. Uh, instead, they are boats. Uh, this is the Alaska State Ferry uh, and seaplanes. So while I had narrowed my search for salmon and trees to a relatively small part of Alaska, it would still take a lifetime to explore all of the Tongas. So where to start and how to get around in a land of islands and jagged peaks? Well, I decided to do something that I did not want to do. Fly in a small plane with the door off. This is definitely a potential hazard. And don't let that smile fool you. Uh, it's one of madness and not joy. But the pilot assured me that I'd be strapped in with fail-safe buckles and a barrier across the opening. Well, one frayed lap belt, one skimpy piece of tape over the buckle, and one worn clothesline across the opening later, I was in the air. I thought if I closed my eyes, it wouldn't be so bad, um, but that would probably defeat the whole purpose. Um, it only took a few minutes, though, for my fear to disappear as the beauty below me uh, took my breath away. Or maybe it was the cinch seatbelt strangling uh, my circulation. <laughs> so I did this because I wanted to get a big picture view of this immense region. And from the air, it's easy to see that the Tongass is a giant mosaic of very different landscapes. And while the Tongass is a national forest, only about 60% is actually forested. The rest is rock, ice, wetlands, and more than 20,000 lakes and ponds, and 40,000 miles of streams. During the last ice age, parts of southeast Alaska were covered in ice, and glaciers had played a very large role in sculpting the Tongass into what we see today. All of the straits and inlets of the Inside Passage of southeast Alaska are glacial fjords, uh, gouged by the Pleistocene glaciers, which bore deep into the bedrock well below sea level. So when the glaciers receded, salt water then flooded these valleys. Tidewater glaciers, this is where the ice and the sea meet, these are found in three areas of southeast Alaska. One is Glacier Bay National Park, and the other two are in the Tongass National Forest. So from the air, you get this big glacial picture of the region, but nothing will help you understand the forces of glaciers more than actually being on one. And even better is being under one. It is here where the glacier seems most alive, where rock and ice duke it out. And through sheer weight, the ice bears down and the rock succumbs. But long after the glaciers retreat, uh, the rock bounces back. Uh, the land in southeast Alaska, freed from this enormous weight of ice, has uplifted in a process called isostatic rebound. And in places, the land has risen hundreds of feet, and it's still rising today in this geologically active part of the world. So what do glaciers have to do with salmon and trees? Well, when the glaciers retreated, some new occupants then moved in. Uh, seeds, spores, uh, bugs, shrubs, birds, uh, beavers, trees, uh, deer, wolves, fish, bears, uh, and people. And the forest was born. So where this rock is in 1916 is where the glaciers used to be. Um, so you can kind of get a sense of uh, what has come in since the glaciers uh, have retreated. Um, and it is in the forest, of course, where I will find trees and perhaps salmon in the trees. And besides, I will be out of that airplane and safely back on the ground. Although safe is a relative term here. One of the world's highest densities of brown bears, these are also known as grizzly bears, um, lives here, as well as the highest densities of black bears in the world. And the forests are quite thick, so it's not like you can see a bear coming a mile away. Sometimes you can't even see a bear coming a few footsteps away. So surely if I stayed on the water, maybe out, you know, back out in the ocean, um, I'd be okay, right? Well, bears can swim. And the sea is loaded with large creatures with large teeth as well. 
And at certain times of the year, it's hard to look anywhere on or under the water and not see something stunning. Doll's porpoises, uh, clocked at speeds of 30 knots, may be the fastest of all the small cetaceans. When I plunged into the icy waters here, uh, I was astounded at all of the colorful life. Uh, this is a China rockfish, and there are many different species of rockfish, and uh, many rockfish live to be uh, well into their hundreds. Um, you can imagine a fish living that long. Um, so this is a China rockfish among uh, cold water Gorgonian corals. Uh, who knew that there were such colorful uh, life and corals uh, in Alaska? And this is a sea anemone, and they come in all various sizes and shapes and colors, and they're just absolutely stunning. Uh, these are nudibranchs, uh, known as uh, the slugs of the sea, and they're quite beautiful as well. So again, I was just fascinated with all the colorful and uh, the tiny life underwater. Um, but these big guys, uh, these are stellar sea lions. Uh, males can be 9 feet in length and 1,500 pounds. Um, they buzzed me on more than one occasion. And you have no idea just how fast and powerful they are until you find yourself face to face with one or 10, because they seem to roam around in large gangs. For sheer size, though, nothing beats the humpback whale. So humpbacks migrate to this area in Alaska every spring, uh, traveling thousands of miles from their birthing grounds in places like Hawaii to dine on the smorgasbord of herring and small shrimp called krill. So sometimes the whales employ a technique uh, called bubble net feeding. This is where they spiral upward, uh, blowing a curtain of bubbles that corrals the prey. They then burst through the surface, scooping up the lassoed rewards. It's, it's quite stunning to be able to see this, and it's stunning enough to see it from the surface, but to actually see it from the air, you really get a sense of what they're doing. You, you really don't, you know, you don't see that curtain of bubbles uh, from the surface. And there's nothing quite as thrilling as being in the middle of a pod of humpback whales. But if you are in a hurry to get somewhere, um, they can be quite annoying, uh, as they will disrupt your schedule. And while they sucked hours and days away from my search for salmon in trees, I have to admit that they were a welcome distraction. So do I travel by land or by sea? Well, both. It's how the native people lived for thousands of years, and today, people's lives here are tied to both. The Tongass is traditionally Tlingit Indian territory, and in more recent times, uh, home to some Haida and Simshin people as well. All native peoples of the area traditionally located their villages just above high tide line. So the tidal exchanges in this part of the world are huge, uh, more than 20 feet in places. Uh, life definitely revolves around uh, ocean tides here. Everybody carries a tide table uh, in their back pocket. You would never leave home without it. Um, so with clams, seaweed, uh, gumboot, chitons, and other food sources out their front door, uh, the native folks have a saying that very much holds true today. When the tide is out, the table is set. Since time immemorial, the sea has been an important food source for the first peoples of the Tongass, and it continues to be today. Uh, these are two young men uh, filleting a halibut uh, in their community. And here, um, the whole community is pitching in. They are preparing smoked um, seal meat and seal intestine in the foreground there, and smoked salmon uh, in the background. And all of this gets divvied up among all of the community members. The forest is important, too, uh, for things like berries uh, and medicinal plants, and trees for totem poles, uh, longhouses, uh, and weaving materials. This part of the world is uh, renowned for its uh, artwork. It's just superb. Uh, it's no surprise that the artworks, dances, and oral histories of the native folks in the Tongass region are rich with stories of people and creatures like salmon, bears, and whales uh, transforming into one another. Clans like killer whale, frog, and wolf speak to the importance of both the land and the sea. In the native cultures here, family lines follow the mother, and people belong to one of two major groups uh, known as moieties. So here you are either an eagle or you are a raven. I had the honor of spending time uh, with many native people who allowed me a glimpse into their culture. In the village of Klawak on Prince of Wales Island, I spent time in John Rowan Jr.'s carving shed. 
John is a Clinket Eagle of the Shank YD Wolf Clan. He's also a United States Marine and a native arts teacher instructing students in carving, language, oral history, and dancing. In addition to teaching the next generation of kids, John is overseeing the carving of the third generation of totem poles for his village. 21 poles in all with at least 250 hours going into each one. This is a huge undertaking. Carving next to him is 15-year-old Noelle Demmer. She's a Clinket Eagle of the Kaguantan clan, and she's the lead carver on this totem pole to honor a Haida man who carved and gifted a canoe to the people of her village. So John told me that not too long ago, the native people here were hanging on to their culture by their fingernails. And he says today that there has been a resurgence, and he hopes that the youth uh, grab hold and run with it. I was honored to attend the pole raising ceremony for the pole Noel carved under John's watchful eye. Uh, this is an occasion of great celebration, uh, where the people dress in their clan regalia and perform uh, traditional dances and songs. Um, this is Noel, um, the young uh, lead carver on that pole. And this is John, uh, watching very proudly uh, as she's being honored. And no celebration like this in the native culture would be complete without a feast, including salmon, one of the most important food sources uh, for the native cultures and an important part of the economy uh, for many people uh, in the region of southeast Alaska. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, salmon. Uh, in trees, uh, the focus of my quest. You can see how easy it is to get distracted here. So where there are salmon fishermen, there must be salmon. So I hook up with Carl Jordan. He's a fourth generation Alaskan salmon fisherman out of Sitka on Baranoff Island. Carl is proud to catch what he considers the best food in the world. At 28 years old, he's more in tune with his connection to the natural world than most people twice his age. His commute aboard his 38-foot trolling boat takes him past forested islands and breaching whales. He looks for seabirds feeding on herring, a good sign that salmon may be present. Weather, tides, and water temperatures guide his decisions, and he knows he's part of an intricate web. Carl is typical of many fishermen in the Tongass region, and I think that most of us are surprised to learn that small mom-and-pop operators like him deliver the best food in the world to our grocery stores and restaurants. Um, this is Carl's young family, and uh, everybody helps out uh, in the cleaning of the boat. So Carl tells me that he's thankful for the salmon because they do us an awesome service uh, by nourishing our bodies. And then he says something that makes my head spin. He says that when the salmon swim into the forest, they nourish the trees too. Could this be salmon in the trees? So I promptly thank him, I jump off the boat, and I head back to land. So I needed to find salmon in the forest, so I asked a wildlife biologist where to go, and he said, any stream. Now, given that I didn't have an entire lifetime to explore the 40,000 miles of streams in the Tongass, I asked if he could be a little more specific. He repeated, as if I were a stubborn child who was pestering him with a silly, curious question, any stream. Well, he was right. So when you go looking for salmon in streams, you will almost certainly see bears as well, whether you want to or not. So on Admiralty Island, it would be highly unusual not to see bears, and that's where I was headed. The Clinket people call this island Kutsnuwu, which translates into Fortress of the Bears. It's an appropriate name, as Admiralty has one of the highest densities of brown bears in the world, uh, an average of nearly one bear per square mile. Um, so if you don't really want to see grizzly bears, this is an island you would want to skip. <laughs> so islands worldwide, uh, think of the Galapagos uh, or Hawaii, these are living laboratories uh, for studying the effects that islands have on the distribution of animals and plants. And the islands of the Tongass are no exception. The mix of wildlife on any island uh, is a combination of many things, so things like time, uh, chance, uh, mobility, predation, uh, and resistance to drowning. So again, in the Tongass, if you don't want to see brown bears, then there are actually three islands that you should not visit. Uh, Admiralty, Baranoff, and Chichigoff Islands. These are known as the ABC Islands. There are no black bears on these three islands, although black bears are plentiful on other islands, and both brown and black bears live on the mainland. 
Scientists studying the brown bears on the ABC islands theorize that they are descendants of a long isolated group and they're more closely related to polar bears uh, than they are to the brown bears on the mainland. And this research supports the idea that there were pockets of land uh, called refugia, uh, not entirely covered by ice during the last ice age. Now, it's fascinating to contemplate the past, um, but the second that you step foot on Admiralty Island, all that matters is the present. There's nothing like being in a place known as the Fortress of the Bears uh, to make you acutely aware of the here and now. You're in someone else's home, someone a lot bigger and stronger than you, and it would be nice to return to your own home at some point. Um, this is what is left of the trailhead um, after the bears got done uh, chewing it. So when you step foot on Admiralty Island, uh, you're on your very best behavior. It's as if Miss Manners, or the Queen of England herself, uh, greeted you at the shores of the island. So you announce yourself, you're considerate, you're super clean with your food, uh, you give your host, particularly the lady of the house and her offspring, uh, plenty of personal space. Now, if you do all of these things, you'll likely have a pleasant visit, uh, perhaps extraordinary. Um, so this is the mouth of Pat Creek on Admiralty Island, and this is a beautiful example of a rich estuary. This is a place where freshwater streams empty into protected bays of the coastline. And an estuary is in a constant state of flux as the tides ebb and flow. So they're always pushing around um, all the sand, and it's, just, it's changing all the time, and then all these salt-tolerant plants uh, grow on these sandbars, and they're incredibly uh, nutritious. Um, and biologically, uh, estuaries are highly productive areas, and they support a rich mix of terrestrial uh, and marine life. Again, these uh, nutritious sedges uh, grow in estuaries and nourish many animals. And I had no idea just how much salad bears will eat uh, until I watched them grazing on sedges day after day. So when I visited Admiralty Island in early August, uh, salmon were leaving the ocean and entering uh, the estuary. And sure enough, there were plenty of bears waiting for them. Now there's nothing like watching bears in their home, and at Pat Creek, um, there are no fences, there's no guard dogs, there's uh, no armed guards keeping watch over us. Um, the only thing really that separates us here uh, is respect. Um, so again, this is the mouth of Pat Creek. Uh, the, the creek is uh, emptying into the ocean here. And so you, you dock your kayak or vessel or however you arrived here, your seaplane, and you walk out here to this little spit and there's a little trail right here and then you, you just sit right there. And then hopefully the bears are coming in and uh, uh, catching salmon. And these two little brown dots there are definitely bears, um, but they come a lot closer than that. We actually had a bear actually run through this little area right there. So this is the on the ground uh, viewing area that I just showed you from the air. Again, no fences, you know, nothing, nothing protecting us here um, other than you know, our brains. <laughs> and for the most part, it seemed that as long as we stayed kind of in our space, then the bears seemed to stay in theirs. But every now and then, a younger bear gets chased into our space by a dominant bear, or it seems like a bear maybe just gets curious as to what we, what we are and what we're doing. And these are the encounters that you don't ever forget. And you don't ever forget who is in charge. One evening, our commute back to our camp was delayed uh, by about an hour until this bear uh, wandered away from our vehicle. So I'm watching the bears here because the salmon are here. But why are the salmon here? Salmon are remarkable creatures. They're born in freshwater streams and rivers, they head out to the oceans to mature, and then they return to their birth streams as adults to spawn the next generation. Now think about that for a minute. The salmon are out in the ocean, thousands of miles from where they were born, and somehow, at just the right time, they find their way back to the very place where they started their lives, without MapQuest or a GPS device. That has to be one of the greatest feats of nature. And the Tonga supports all five species of Pacific salmon, and every summer and fall, millions of wild salmon fill the more than 4,000 spawning streams in the Tongass. This is the time of year when the whole place just comes alive. 
Where there's a concentration of food, uh, the crowds show up, uh, not unlike a Friday night all-you-can-eat buffet. So the great numbers of salmon help to explain why the Tongass region supports the world's highest nesting density of bald eagles and why there are 80 bears here for every one bear found inland far from salmon streams. And to watch this feeding frenzy has got to be one of the greatest spectacles on our planet. More than 50 species have been documented feeding on salmon. Uh, among them, uh, black bears, uh, brown bears on uh, gulls, uh, river otters, uh, bald eagles, mink, uh, harbor seals, sea lions, uh, orcas, and people as well. I know I eagerly uh, await the salmon's return, and by the looks of uh, the face of my husband in the photo here, um, he does too. <laughs> Even more astounding, though, is that enough salmon dodge this deadly obstacle course uh, of the beaks and jaws of animals, as well as the nets and hooks of people, to sustain their populations year after year. And they've been doing this for thousands and thousands of years. So during salmon time, the competition for food can be fierce. That's every bird and beast for himself. And while the larger animals usually have first dibs uh, on the salmon, um, there are other ways to get a meal. Um, so the eagle in the center here, he's got a salmon carcass uh, in his talon, and the eagle on the left uh, is uh, thinking about perhaps um, stealing it. Um, but uh, keep an eye on Raven over here. Um, so this is typical eagle behavior, uh, the eagle in the center is standing on his food, he's guarding it, he's vocalizing, he's pretty much shrieking to the guy on the left, you know, stay away or I'm going to you know, beat you up. And the guy on the left is being very submissive, putting his head down. And so while these guys are squabbling, um, what do you think Raven's going to do? <laughs> you know, after watching Ravens for quite a while, it's very easy to see why the native people of the region refer to Raven as the trickster. So while there is a lot of action going on at the mouths of salmon streams and in these estuaries, I notice that many salmon make it past this gateway between ocean and land, and they keep swimming upstream into the forest. So this is kind of a perfect example of kind of the route uh, that salmon are taking. So the ocean is out here somewhere, and this is the intertidal area. This is that rich estuary where there's you know, different channels of the streams uh, um, all throughout that area. And then, so the salmon, they, they leave the ocean, they're kind of weaving their way through that intertidal area, and then they find the main channel of the stream here. And this whole black mass, that's all salmon. And again, every stream looks like this uh, at a certain time of year. It's, it's just astounding to watch. Um, so anyway, so these guys, they find the main channel, and then they keep heading upstream. And um, so I decide to follow them and find out uh, where they're going. And for this, I head to Wrangell Island where I meet up with a woman named Brenda Schwartz Yeager. Brenda is a fourth generation Alaskan whose ancestors worked as bounty hunters, trappers, and big game guides. Brenda tells me she's the first generation in her family uh, to be able to bring people to the Tongass and not take anything other than photographs. Brenda says that in society today, people are used to pushing a button and controlling their scenery, uh, the temperature, or the sound. Uh, but in a real wilderness, she says, we quickly realize that we're not in control, and it's humbling. And she thinks it's good for us to be humbled. And probably no other place Brenda goes allows people to experience wild Alaska better than Annan Creek. So off we go, uh, headed for the mainland, zooming over the water in her boat named the Wild Side. So we moor the boat at the mouth of the creek, and we enter the forest on foot. It's mid-August, and the place is just absolutely thrumming uh, with life as gobs of salmon are making their way upstream. The harpy screams of ravens uh, emanate from the forest. Bald eagles uh, swoop from treetop to rock top, uh, eyeballing the feast before them. Hordes of Bonaparte gulls descend upon the stream, and they're scooping up the salmon eggs. Uh, about a mile into the forest, uh, the stream is pinched by a series of waterfalls and the salmon are jammed up. It is here where the big boys gather for the all-you-can-eat buffet. Now, black bears are the star attraction here, 
And since Anna and Creek is on the mainland and not one of the islands, uh, brown bears occasionally show up too. The bears are definitely wary of one another, uh, but they tolerate each other's presence because the food is uh, so plentiful. There's definitely a hierarchy though, and the bigger the bear, the better the fishing spot. And I have to say that these are some of the healthiest bears I have ever seen. The place is just crawling with bears, and there's so much going on that I don't know where to point my camera. So I try to focus on the bears fishing uh, when another bear uh, jumps onto the viewing platform, and uh, this interrupts my concentration and forces me to move back. Uh, still another pair, bear passes just a few feet behind me, and yet another bear hangs above me. <laughs> So you're in this place, again, it's just crawling with bears, and they're all over the place, and you don't really know when they're coming or going. They're really, really quiet animals. Um, and you really start looking around and asking yourself, who's watching whom? Am, am I watching the bears, or are they watching me? So I try to ignore the bears, and I focus on the salmon. Uh, so fin to fin, tail to a tail. Uh, the, they sway against the current as one giant mob. And I forget that they're individual fish, uh, until one springs from the crowd, uh, hurling itself against the foaming wall of water. And then another, and another. And this goes on for hours, days, weeks. But for the salmon, every minute is precious as their time is coming to an end. They've stopped eating. They're in their final act, spawning. And they won't stop pushing upstream until they die. It's a testament to the power of the biological clock. Passing on their genes is their mission in life, and once accomplished, they pay for it with their lives. So after spawning, uh, they die. Uh, that's just their life cycle. So if you're a salmon, uh, there's no such thing as safe sex. <laughs> so stinking, rotten salmon carcasses are just everywhere, and the stench is almost unbearable. Uh, no pun intended. And I'm surrounded by death. Uh, but in death, there is life. So as I contemplate the life cycle of these incredible fish, a bear zooms up a tree with a salmon in its mouth. Could this be salmon in the trees? Well, technically, this is salmon up a tree. So how the heck does salmon get in the trees? Away from the creek, I spot a fresh salmon with a bite taken out of it, dragged and dropped in the forest. Suddenly, the thing I'd been searching for was staring me in the face, and it all made perfect sense. The salmon, bears, trees, soil, bugs, roots, berries, birds, and the bees. It was all right here in this glorious cycle of life, one of the greatest shows on earth, and one that plays out all over the Tongass every year. So here's the deal. Scientists have found high concentrations of a nitrogen variant in trees near salmon streams. This variant, it's called nitrogen 15, and it comes from the ocean. So how did it find its way from the sea into the forest? It swam there, in the bodies of salmon loaded with marine nutrients from their time at sea. But how does it get into the trees? Well, bears have a lot to do with this. Bears don't particularly like being around other bears, so when they catch a fish, they will often carry it away from the stream and into the woods. It turns out that bears can move a lot of salmon into the forest. Researchers say that one bear can carry 40 fish from a stream in eight hours. So multiply that by uh, weeks, months uh, sometimes, and thousands and thousands of bears, and that's a lot of salmon carcasses uh, in the forest. And toward the end of the salmon season, uh, bears can afford to be picky, and they are usually just targeting the richest parts of the fish, and they leave the rest behind. Uh, this certainly doesn't go to waste, though. Other animals scavenge on these carcasses, and this spreads the nutrients even farther uh, throughout the forest. Well, guess what happens? All of this rich fish fertilizer uh, decomposes into the soil, and the trees and other vegetation absorb it through their roots. And that is how salmon end up in the trees. Now, not to be outdone, the trees return the favor by nurturing the salmon. Trees shade the spawning streams, keeping water temperatures cool for developing eggs. Their roots help stabilize the stream banks. Uh, this prevents erosion from fouling the clean water and gravel beds the salmon need to lay their eggs. And fallen trees over the pools, uh, or over the streams, create protected pools and provide food for insects for the young salmon. 
So in parts of the Tongass, trees help grow salmon and salmon help grow trees. So salmon are part ocean and they are part forest. When you understand this connection, this remarkable connection uh, between salmon and trees, um, then you quickly start to see other connections. Bald eagles, fueled by salmon, will soar greater distances to find food during the lean winter months. Female bears, padded with fat reserves, will give birth in their dens and nurse their tiny cubs with salmon-enriched milk. The forest, fertilized with supercharged soil from decayed fish, will sprout new growth come spring. And the salmon? Well, as winter arrives, the last of the adult fish are spawned out and their nutrient-packed bodies pick clean. But they didn't die in vain. Swaddled in the streams and incubated by the forest, their fertilized eggs will soon hatch the next generation, ensuring that the cycle of life is a circle, always flowing, never broken. In the Tongass, what goes around comes around. And that goes for us too. Salmon help us understand that we also need healthy forests and oceans for the gifts of clean water, air, and food. And what we do to the forests can affect the oceans, and what we do to the oceans can affect the forests. So what's the threat to the Tongass? Well, it's helpful to know a little history. When Russians and Europeans arrived on these forested shores in the 1700s, they saw a land of superabundance, and they started taking things. They started taking things in great quantities, uh, things like gold, uh, sea otter furs, uh, whale oil, and salmon. Now, we were a little slow to start taking timber in great quantities in this part of the world, but that all changed after World War II. Industrial-scale logging began in earnest here, and some of the great forests of the Tongass began to fall. Thousands of miles of logging roads and clear cuts have degraded parts of the Tongass, uh, impacting some salmon streams and the people and wildlife who rely on them. Keep in mind that as big as the Tongass is, 17 million acres, 40% is not forested at all. It's rock, ice, uh, wetlands, and fresh water. Only 30% of the Tongass contains what are called productive old growth forests uh, with commercial timber value. And less than 3% of the entire Tongass consists of what are called these big tree productive old growth forests. These are among the areas most valuable to wildlife, including salmon and the people who rely on them. So while these big tree productive old growth forests are best known for their centuries old giants, they are in fact what ecologists call multi-aged or ageless forests. And I'll explain uh, what I mean by this. So when a giant falls, uh, like this guy here, um, just snapped off on his own, um, this creates a gap in the a canopy and this allows light to reach the forest floor and stimulate new growth. Saplings and shrubs sprout and clamor for the sky, and all ages and sizes of trees create a multi-storied canopy. And in one of these forests, uh, again, in death, there is life. Um, a fallen tree uh, right here becomes a nurse log. Uh, it's decay providing nutrients uh, for new trees. You can see the one growing on top of it here. Uh, many decades later, we can see where that ghost log, or that nurse log once was, now referred to as a ghost log, um, that again, that nourished the, this tree that started its life uh, on top of it. And you'll, you'll see a lot of these in the forest. It's a really neat thing if you know what you're looking at. Uh, dead trees do not go to waste in a forest like this. Um, this is a dead snag and it provides homes and lookout spots uh, for all kinds of critters. And the feast that the forest provides uh, nourishes many different animals. Uh, this is a plant called Devil's Club, and its large clumps of berries are an important food source for bears, and it's one of the most important medicinal plants uh, to the native people. This is bunchberry. This is a critical food source for the Sitka black-tailed deer, uh, particularly in the winter months, and the deer, in turn, is an important food source for wolves, bears, uh, and many of the local people here. So what happens in a forest like this after all the trees are removed? Well, there is a lot of new growth at first. Again, light is hitting that forest floor, and this does stimulate new growth. Um, but this doesn't last long, and, and here's why. In a relatively short amount of time, just a few decades or so, the even-aged trees that then grow up create a closed canopy, and they shade out any understory plants. 
Um, this particular forest was clear cut about 60 years ago, and bio biologically today, um, it's a desert. There's nothing green in here, absolutely no food uh, for wildlife, um, particularly, again, the deer. And there are now many parts of the Tongass that look like this, and scientists have determined that the forest will persist in this state uh, for several centuries before it begins to develop the complex structural characteristics of a productive old growth forest again. So while trees are renewable, uh, an old growth forest in this part of the world really isn't, not on any kind of human time frame. So what's left? Well, of North America's original coastal temperate rainforest, which once extended intact from south central Alaska to northern California, um, so again, all the way up here, uh, all the way down to northern California, and the different um, shades of green here just represent different climate zones, and within each climate zone, you'll find a different mix of uh, plants and animals. So of that original glorious uh, rainforest, 44% uh, has been affected by urban development, logging, or farming. And most of this has taken place um, from Vancouver Island and British Columbia um, south. So anywhere we see in red um, has been developed, and those original forests are now gone. And for many of these uh, forests, they were long gone. Um, we got to a lot of these, particularly the redwoods in Northern California, mid to late 1800s. Um, and because that happened so long ago, I mean, who among us can remember uh, what these forests once contained. But here's the good news, and it's the whole reason that I've spent the last three years of my life uh, pursuing this story and why I'm, uh, I'm talking to you about it um, tonight. Uh, the Tongass is located up here, and remarkably, uh, enough critical areas are still intact, holding the ecological integrity of the whole place together. All of the species that existed at the time of European settlement are still here, Nothing is missing. Brown bears, wiped out in most of the lower 48 states, live here in some of the highest densities in the world, in part due to all of the healthy wild salmon runs, uh, which in turn support other species, uh, as well as a viable and sustainable fishing industry. Humpback whales find enough to eat to fuel their long migrations. The native people still live where their ancestors have since time immemorial. There aren't many places in what is today the United States where we can say this. All of the local people here enjoy a very special way of life. And visitors come here because there is no other place like it on the planet. Um, and for those of you who maybe have visited this part of the world, maybe been on a cruise up the Inside Passage, um, you may have seen some of these uh, incredible places. Um, for those of you who haven't, um, one of the things I really like to let people know is that this is an incredibly accessible place to travel. Um, this is a place where the average American can go to. It's not that remote. Um, it's not that expensive to get to. Um, parts of it, again, are very accessible. There are parts that are, that are remote. You can have a very uh, healthy wilderness experience if you'd like, but there are places where uh, you can go, watch bears catching salmon, and you can be back in a comfortable hotel room at night. Um, it's pretty astounding that way. Um, so why do people come? Well, they come for many reasons. Um, they come here to walk in the rainforest, uh, to see bears, to explore the unique cave features here, uh, to fish, to eat the best salmon in the world, uh, to taste a wild Alaskan blueberry. There's nothing like these. To see glaciers and maybe even walk on one if you're so inclined. Uh, to scuba dive, believe it or not. Very cold water, but again, incredible life. Uh, to kayak. To learn about the native cultures, uh, both past and present. To be out on the ocean, watching for humpback whales, and maybe, if you're lucky, even see one breach. So while people come for many different reasons, I think that they all leave with Alaska in their hearts. Now, some of the most biologically critical areas of the Tongass are not protected. And threats to them include continued logging, uh, mining, industrial-scale tourism, 
uh, energy development, global climate change, and who knows what else down the road. Things we're probably not even thinking of today. Yet despite these threats, I have hope. I think that we can get it right in the Tongas, simply because there is still time to do so, and we know it's the right thing to do. And we have an unprecedented opportunity to ensure that the most biologically rich areas stay that way. So let us learn from the lessons that salmon in the trees teach us, that everything is connected, that this most magnificent of rainforest thrives because all of its pieces still exist, and that we are a part of it all, too. Globally, coastal temperate rainforests are rare, covering just one thousandth of the Earth's land surface. So anywhere you see in green, these are the only places on the entire planet where this type of ecosystem has ever existed. Again, very rare. Uh, and many of these areas um, are now gone. Uh, but again, Tongass is up here. And it contains one third of the world's old growth temperate rainforest and the largest reserves of intact old growth forest left in our country. So as you can see, we've been given a great gift and an even greater responsibility. The Tongass is public land entrusted to all of us. So whether you live in Missouri, Alaska, Florida, Illinois, it's yours. And because of that, we all have a say, and we can all make our voice heard. And the decisions that we make today will determine whether or not the Tongass will continue to be a place where there are salmon in the trees. Thank you. So does anyone have any questions before I run out and start signing books? Don't be shy. <laughs> so many fisheries are depleted. How is this one? This one is in, it's in great shape. This is one of the world's best examples of a uh, sustainably managed fishery. There is an international organization called the Marine Stewardship Council that certifies fisheries um, based on all kinds of factors. They're very thorough in what they look at, and the Alaska Salmon fishery was one of the first ones that they looked at really hard, and I think it was one of the first ones that they actually gave the sustainable uh, certification to. It, it's amazing. I mean, salmon are such a way of life up there. Um, whether you are a commercial fisherman, whether someone in your family is, um, whether you fish yourself and, and, and eat salmon, um, it's a way of life. Um, and they're very aware, just because salmon have been uh, threatened or are threatened and endangered in other parts of their original range. Um, the Alaskans are very aware that they don't want that to ha happen up there. And, and it's, it's quite interesting. They actually, they limit the size of the boats. They limit the kind of gear you can use. So, you know, from, a, from an efficiency standpoint, you'd think we'd go in there with the, the largest boat, the best gear, and just, you know, haul out every fish we possibly could. But if we did that, we wouldn't be fishing for very long. So it's pretty, prim it's almost primitive the way that they fish up there, but that limits um, the number of fish that are taken. And um, it's, it's great to be up there during salmon time. Um, you know, when you listen to the radios and in the papers, I mean, fish are headline news. Um, the, uh, you know, they'll announce the opening of whatever season is going on and, and they will close that. You know, they might close it in 17 minutes. You know, they're, they're monitoring it. They're keeping a very close tab on how many fish are being caught. Um, it's, it's, really quite, it's really quite exciting, actually. But uh, yeah, still in great shape up there, and still best food in the world. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry. Oh, fantastic. And sorry. All right. So the question was, how much? How much what what has changed in 20 years? Probably. Um, Right, and they, and they were still logging very heavily back then, too. What, 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 it, what has changed, there were two pulp mills um, that were set up in the 1950s. One was in the town of Ketchikan, one was in the town of Sitka. Um, and those pulp mills were what was causing all of the logging. It, it's a long history. Um, and that all ended uh, early, not early to late 90s. Both those pulp mills closed down. And ever since then, the people have kind of been scrambling and trying to figure out you know, what, what they can do to replace um, those lost jobs. So we actually have kind of, there's been a lull in logging or like large-scale industrial clear-cut logging. 
Um, so again, to me, that's like the great opportunity that we have to actually figure something out and try and protect these last um, strongholds. And you know, for the most part, the people are figuring out other ways. Again, tourism has gotten very big up there in the last 20 years. Um, so a lot of people have, are you know, going into that. Um, it's still an incredible place. So yeah, I, th I think you'd be surprised. <laughs> Anyone else? OK, well, I'll be back signing books. So if you have any questions, um, I'll be back there as well. Thank you very, very much for coming. <laughs>